Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Society of Geneva. We seek to meet you wherever you are on your journey and invite you to be part of this congregation in which we draw wisdom from all the world's religions balanced with the insights of modern science. We seek to build a diverse, beloved community within our virtual walls and hope to inspire and accompany one another as we act for peace and justice in our larger world. Has anyone here played the lottery game? I usually do this one in the shower. I'm just sitting there thinking about things, letting my mind drift, and I wonder, what would happen if I won a million dollars? What would I do next? What would you do next? A million dollars. It's a lot of money. Maybe you'd buy a car, a new TV, something fancy, something for yourself. I have debt, so those would get paid. I'd like to pay for the college for my kids. And whatever's left over would probably end up in an IRA. We can do a lot with a million dollars. But depending on where we wanted to live, you know, I may not even buy us that dream house. So as I'm sitting there in the morning, I think, what if I raise the limit? How about $10 million? Now with $10 million, we're talking, right? I'm talking retirement in Hawaii. Plenty of money to fly in friends and family. In fact, I could help out my brother and my sister pay my debts and theirs and send my kids and theirs to college wherever they wanted to go. Have I mentioned that I would be an awesome rich person? <laughs> when the game hits 100 million, we're talking 1,500 years worth of income pre-tax for the average family here in Illinois, 1,500 years of income. That's 100 million bucks. This game suddenly is no longer about me. All my desires, wishes, and wants, those are easily covered. Toys, yeah, I got them. Trips anywhere in the world, let's go. Rubbing elbows with movie stars and national politicians, totally on the agenda. This is where things get interesting for me. I want to say that most of us, at some point on this fantasy arc, will turn to philanthropy. We give to our church. Something, uh, just for the record, UUSG would be deeply grateful for, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. But after that, maybe we fund that community shelter, set up an endowment at our alma mater, in whatever subject it is that would annoy dad the most. Start a nonprofit, feed the hungry, give back, stuff like that. I can imagine doing all manner of do-gooder things. I have a list, actually. And when the game gets to a billion dollars, 10 billion, I mean, if you're gonna play, you might as well play, right? But with that much money, well, my imagination at least, it starts to break down, short circuits. Because with that much money, I could do anything. I could change the world. I could be Batman. This is a good time in our service to do our thing. So I'm gonna ask our tech team to invite our remote guests into the sanctuary if that's possible. And we're gonna ask to remove that Zoom spotlight. So uh, our online friends, go ahead into your interface and click gallery view. And if you haven't turned on your camera, this would be an awesome time to do so. <clears throat> so in the spirit of our friend, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III of Trinity Church here in Chicago, I wanna ask you now to turn to a neighbor. Turn to a neighbor. Yeah, right now. I can totally see you. Now, with your masks and using your indoor voices, repeat after me. <clears throat> Say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. This, this is, is 
our, our work. work. This is our work. Excellent. Well done. <clears throat> Amen. So this past summer, the world was blessed with a new social media meme. Can we get meme number one on the meme big screen? <clears throat> In this meme, we find our befuddled hero facing a control board with two buttons in front of him. One says, end world hunger. And the other one says, launch self into space. I'm sure you remember this, right? There in the news, we were reading about Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Sir Richard Branson building rockets and buying themselves short trips into outer space. The meme is funny. It's funny. And it plays into that sense we all have that the rich are out of touch, frivolous, and in point of fact, they are terrible rich people and totally don't even deserve the undeniable and unbelievable wealth that they have. I mean, you and I would do better, wouldn't we? We would. We'd be awesome. They're terrible at this. And that's great because, as we just explored, being a billionaire means we can do pretty much anything. And these idiots are wasting it. It's unbelievable. Can we get meme number two? There are, according to Google, over 2,600 billionaires in the world, and over 600 of them here in the United States. And here's the tragedy. Not a single one of them has become Batman. I'm sure you'll all agree this is completely baffling. Always be Batman. Always! But let's turn to launching myself into space meme just for a minute. I want to put aside the fact that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos together are worth nearly $400 billion combined. That figure is just impossible for me to get my head around. I also, though, want to put aside the fact that these folks are wasting their money. This is not an ego trip that they're doing. There's nothing frivolous about billionaires or how they spend their fortunes. Don't be fooled. The race into outer space is about something. It's about future. It's about empire. But that, that's a sermon for another day. I also want to put aside the idea, the, the idea that they, even with their fabulous wealth, are capable of ending world hunger. Folks over the years have variously hung price tags on hunger, somewhere between 7 billion and 300 billion per year. There is a lot to say about the problem of world hunger. How much of that cost has to do with food? How much with inefficiency, with corruption, with human stupidity? But again, that's not the point. That's beside the point. Musk and Bezos are rich, but ending world hunger rich? No, not quite. Today I want to talk about responsibility, because that's what disturbs me about that meme and all of the others like it. Maybe this is some kind of Spider-Man thing, the with great power comes great responsibility. And if so, why is the answer, hey, everyone, let's shame the super rich in doing, into doing the right thing. All we have to do is click this like button, and then, well, we'll share it, click share with all of our friends. Job done. Take that, rich people. World hunger problem solved. No, no. I want to say no, and I bet many of you do, too. But for many of us, at the end of church today, we'll go get in our cars, and we won't think about climate change. Later, we'll make lunch, maybe go to the market and shop for the week, and we won't think about world hunger. Maybe we'll go to a matinee or turn on the TV, and we won't think about 
the rise in global authoritarianism, war, or violence. We won't. We're normal people. We have normal lives to live. Maybe those problems are just too big, too hard to see the forest when there are all of these trees in front of us, and maybe that's why we fail. Fail to give, fail to help, fail to include, fail to grow, fail to change, fail to look up and see the forest. The trees are just so very big, and there are so many of them. And maybe that's why we expect more of the wealthy. We look at our own limitations and see that the super rich don't have them. And we wonder why they aren't Batman. We demand that they do what we won't. Look, Batman is cool. But Batman doesn't build schools, doesn't hire social workers, doesn't build affordable housing, doesn't fund health clinics, doesn't create and distribute vaccines. Maybe we're thinking of Dolly Parton. <laughs> Batman doesn't fight corporate corruption or greed, isn't working on universal health care or global climate change, and doesn't do anything to expand voting rights or personal empowerment. Honestly, that sounds a lot more like Bernie than Batman. Batman doesn't feed the hungry, tend the sick, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, or center the marginalized. And for the record, that's not socialism, that's Jesus. I want to hammer on this for a second, this idea that the rich will save us, because it's like a snake in the grass. It's everywhere in American culture. The rich, the famous, these are the pinnacle of our culture. We watch, we obsess, we daydream about them, about one day being one of them. They create art, they win Super Bowls, they give speeches, they live glamorous lives full of meaning and beauty, they shape the way we live, work, and play. They are innovators, inventors, change makers, they create jobs, they deserve their money. They deserve our respect and adoration. Did you see the switch there? How quick that went? They are our leaders, our betters, our lords. They tell us what we need to know. Give us what we need in our job. Our only job is faith and loyalty to the cause. I think it's pretty safe to say that this thinking, while tempting, is deeply problem problematic. This point, at one point, I've had this point made over and over again, but the one that strikes me, sticks in my mind, was made a couple of years ago when I read, yes, yet another meme on Facebook. This is the one I like to call Jesus on a park bench. Can we get that on the screen? In this meme, a young man is asking Jesus, who looks remarkably like Kenny Loggins, <clears throat> We're a is asking Jesus, why do you allow famine, war, disease, and human suffering here on earth? And Jesus replies, yeah, I was just about to ask you the same thing. Maybe you've seen this before, some version of it. The first time I saw this, I kind of laughed, and I was moved, and I was uncomfortable because I heard a truth in there. The reason for war, for famine, for disease is very simple. They exist because we allow it. That's oversimplifying. I'll give you that, but the point stands. You and me, all of us, across our state, our nation, our world, we human beings allow it. What Park Bench Jesus is trying to tell us is this, is it doesn't have to be this way. War, famine, and disease, these challenges and others like them are our challenges. Challenges that we are supposed to take up. Challenges that cannot wait for everyone here in the room to win the lottery. So let's be clear. Change is not the work of the few and the mighty. 
It is not their work, it is our work. The work of community is our work. The work to create a better world is our work. The work of human progress is our work. We may have forgotten lost in the forest of daily life, but this work is what it means to be human and alive. It's up to us, all of us, not some magical flying mouse with too much money or some random handful of rich dudes trying to launch themselves into space. Look, if I ever win a billion dollars in the lottery, being Batman would be a lot of fun. But if I want to change the world, as much as I'm a fan, I don't believe it's Batman we need. Or even his alter ego, Bruce Wayne for that matter. We don't need more billionaires. Money alone isn't going to eradicate hunger or war or disease any more than it will eradicate greed or malice or fear or hate. We don't need lottery money because money isn't the answer. If we want change, we can have it, but we're going to have to dig for it. I've said this before, so let me say it again. Human salvation, if any is on offer, will only ever come from human hands. Our hands, ours. Our dirty, chapped, calloused hands. Not with knuckles bruised and bloody with fighting crime, but with dirt under the nails from planting, tilling, and caring for growing things. Because what if it's not superheroes we need? Just more gardeners. What if that's always what we've needed? This would be lucky because gardeners, both metaphorically and literally, are what some say that we human beings have always been. Take it all the way back to the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve are created to tend the Garden of Eden. It's their entire reason for being. At some point, they learn a thing or two and get sent out into the larger world. There, they're given a choice and an opportunity with all of their skills and an intimately familiar model of excellence that they can then build towards. They're given the challenge of making over the entire world into a new Eden. Maybe your Bible doesn't read that way. That's fine. I read mine my way. But I'm going to tell you that good gardening is making space for all to live, to love, and to thrive. That's everywhere in all of our scriptures for a reason. Because it's, as we've said for thousands of years, this is why we humans are here. If you're wondering yourself where to start, where to dig in next, I will suggest humbly and in the interests of time that the announcements portion of our order of service has many great ways to start your next gardening practice. Look and consider where the work of your head, your heart, and your hands can help make our world, your world, a better place. This is how change happens, how growth happens, how love happens. This is our work, the work of human hands, one pair at a time. For now, I'll close with this reading from Emil Goodmanson. It's number 693 in our hymnal. They write, And now may we have faith in life to do wise planting, that the generations to come may reap even more abundantly than we. May we be bold in bringing to fruition the golden dreams of human kinship and justice. This we ask, that the fields of promise become fields of reality. Amen and blessed be. And as we prepare to leave this place, continue your journey in love. Care for one another and care for this, our earth. 
do justice and make peace. And as you go, know that whatever taste or touch you've had in this time or place of hope, joy, love, or peace, that goes with you out into the world. We are different for having spent this time together. So remember, live boldly and with thanksgiving.